Okay, when I went to college, it was Illinois Institute of Technology, which was my local school. I didn't know anything about Frank Lloyd Wright or Mies van der Rohe or Louis Sullivan. And uh, in the school, first of all, was Crown Hall was the first, I was the first class in Crown Hall designed by Mies van der Rohe. And in there was the Institute of Design, which was the photography school uh, where Aaron Siskin and Rick taught and Richard Nickel was a student. And so I began to see their photographs of an exhibition they did on Adler and Sullivan. And in the meantime, my history teacher was an extraordinary man named Alfred Caldwell. And he was a self-taught uh, philosopher, architectural historian. And he also was an influence on Richard Nickel because he would have Richard Nickel photograph his models for, of his students. He taught architecture and he taught history. And his history, lectures were magical. I mean, he would talk in terms of, uh, you know, spirituality and, uh, you know, the, the blue windows and Chartres and so forth. And then he mix it with Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. So they were beautiful lectures. And uh, in the meanwhile, I graduated and, um, I, my first job was at Skidmore Owings in Merrill, and I was only there for one week and no, one month. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, six months. Six months I was at Skidmore Owings in Merrill, and uh, I was told that I would no longer be employed. And the very next day, it was announced that the Garrick Theater was going to be torn down. So Richard Nickel hired me to tear down the Garrick Theater. And that's how I got him very interested in the Garrick Theater. Uh, he hired me and another student named uh, David Norris. Uh, first of all, we picketed I, one more thing about the Garrick, Richard Nickel had a group of men, No, unfortunately there were no women at that time involved, but there were a group of men who picketed to save the Garrick Theater. And this was the first time in history that people picketed to save a commercial building. I, I mean, it was not unheard of to save a single house like the Roby house or, uh, you know, George Washington's house or something like that. But it was, it was an unheard of idea to picket a building that was commercial because that was uh, supposedly your property and you can do what you want. So we were fighting uphill to save a building by picketing, even though we were given a plaque that said the building was a landmark. We had no official uh, backing to oh, save man. the building. So I was then, uh, I now have, uh, I was then hired with Richard Nickel and David Norris to uh, tear down the building. So um, we worked in it for six months. But at the same time in the city, there were many buildings being threatened of, of almost equal importance. Uh, for example, my favorite was the Reliance Building designed by Halliburton Roach. It was a, a very tall building, I'd say uh, maybe 20 stories tall. It was built in 1910 and it was not even made a landmark, but it was such a beautiful building. It was like a classical 
temple from top to bottom with a beautiful cornice. And um, so that building was coming down almost at the same time. And while it was coming down, you could see that the steel was still primed in a beautiful, you know, orange red color. Um, and we'll have pictures of that, of course. And then there was the uh, cable building also by Halliburton Roach. There was um, two small buildings, uh, which you could understand at that time where they, they would come down. One was the first lighter building by uh, William LeBaron Jenny. It was a 10 story building and it was almost the first steel building, but uh, it was not. And then next door to it was a building by Louis Sullivan, very important building called the Rothschild building, also only about 10 stories. But it was Adler and Sullivan's first building where they exploited the verticality of tall buildings. Uh, and then later in that same decade in the 60s, it was announced that the stock exchange would come down. And that of course was one of Adler and Sullivan's greatest buildings. It was their largest building in volume and it was like new inside and, uh, and it was, uh, very well thought out from the ornament to the plan. And um, uh, again, we tried to save it by picketing. We tried starting organizations, but again, we lost and the building came down. And of course, that was the building where uh, Richard Nickel was killed in the building. Uh, I was in charge of saving the uh, stock exchange room, which was um, in the building. And it was disguised with many remodelings, but uh, I took, we took away the remodelings and so forth, cleaned up the building, photographed it very carefully, took all the parts, including the plaster, and we reconstructed the room in the Art Institute of Chicago. My passion for preservation, of course, came from this great loss. I mean, even though I was a modernist, um, I had a little firm uh, uh, with a partner named Larry Kenny. He and I started a partnership and our work was purely modern. In fact, our first house was in the suburb designed by uh, Olmsted, the famous landscaper. It's called Riverside. We had the opportunity to design a house there and that house became a landmark. It's, it's a city landmark now and it's, um, and that was our first house designed in 1972 and completed in 1975. Uh, we also, um, I'm trying to think of other projects we did, did in that year that were modern, but most of them were remodelings of, of apartment buildings. Um, uh, but uh, our work was purely modern, but, you know, but my restoration was separate from my architecture for sure. Um, later on in years in 95, when I, I was basically my own, um, uh, my partner, Larry Kenny had retired and uh, I had just taken on a new partner, Philip Hamp, but I was already in the process uh, of winning a competition to design a new headquarters for the Arts Club of Chicago. Uh, and I was, uh, uh, I was one of 46 architects in the city and nobody thought I would be selected, but for some reason I was selected as the architect, uh, much to the shock of, of the architectural community. And I designed a building to house the Mies van der Rohe staircase. 
that was um, in the former club, which was down the street about, um, you know, 600 feet. Um, anyway, that was very successful, even though the critics were very negative about what I did. Uh, this, the uh, arts club has become very well known and very well liked. Um, it's, uh, it's used for uh, events. It's a very active club for people interested in the arts and the Mies van der Rohe staircase is, uh, is within the building um, uh, encased in the glass just the way it was meant to be. Uh, unfortunately, it could not be on the street as it was originally because I wanted to accommodate uh, handicap and elevators and so forth. So it's, uh, but it's a modern building without question. And, uh, and the staircase looks like it belongs there. Well, I think I think these buildings are high points in in the in our lives and in the history of architecture. They're not mediocre buildings. They're they're buildings that had something to say about society, the architecture, um, where what we aspire to be. And uh, I think they they work within the cityscape. Uh, and when they're gone, it's it's like you change the character of an area where it becomes unidentifiable. Uh, for example, right now in Chicago, we have managed to save, uh, <clears throat> I would say, maybe. 20 very important buildings still in this loop area. And they give you um, sort of, they, they give you a, a, a sort of a landmark of where you are. I mean, you don't feel lost anymore and you pa you're passing that on to the next generation. For example, when the Garrick came down, nobody could visualize where the Garrick was. I mean, this is amazing. I mean, <laughs> as I said, when a building is gone, it's gone. Um, and, and you lose your sense of where, uh, where you, you are within, the, within this society. Well, they become they become something in your subconscious that you do know. For example, as a child, <laughs> when I knew nothing of architecture, I knew the Monadnock block was a very strange building. You know, there here was this building of masonry going up seventeen stories. I knew that Carson Peary Scott was um, this, this was Adler and Sullivan's. I mean, it was Louis Sullivan's department store. Yeah. I knew that was a beautiful building. Um, so, you know, you don't have to educate only the sophisticated. They are a subconscious education for everybody. And, and someday some child like me will walk by and that will make, maybe make him want to be an architect. Um, there's a story once where my life was threatened. Um, there was a little Frank Lloyd Wright house in a bad area of Chicago called the Walzer House. And an art dealer called me and he said, I just received a phone call from Phyllis Lambert. She, um, what is it about? I said, well, you were trying to sell windows from that house. And I, I said, I told her, don't buy windows from an existing house. And he said, why not? He said, 
it's in a bad area. It'll burn down, you know, it was just after the Martin Luther King riots. He said, that house will burn down. And I said, so what? I mean, at least it would have a life of its own in its place. I said, but right now it should stay there. It's in a poor area. Some child, again, may see that house and know it's different than the other houses. And it may inspire him to be an architect. I mean, that, I mean, this is a silly example, but it's a true example of uh, the viciousness of people who want to, to make art uh, a commodity instead of a, a feature or a, a landmark of society. Well, I started the project because in my office, they were doing Revit and, uh, you know, I would come in a little late. I couldn't keep, I didn't keep up with it. I didn't learn Revit. So in my head, I had this idea to make better drawings of the Garrick. So I started with the existing drawings made by Adler and Sullivan's office. There were some renderings that I never quite understood the bearing wall system. So I started these drawings in late 2018. And in 2019, in about, uh, I think it was uh, August, I talked to Fred Eichner, who is the uh, owner of Alpha Wood, and he, he conceived of Alpha Wood and uh, is the source of the financing of Alpha Wood. And I said, Fred, uh, now that you have this new museum, I have a nice idea for a small exhibition in, uh, on, the, on the Garrick. I said, you know, it, it has to do with the politics of architecture and it has to do with the architecture. So this is now 2019. And he said, well, you contact Alpha Wood and they'll give you a free hand. So in 2019, I met with Alpha Wood and we, we, I gave him a proposal, which was grander than a few drawings. And I worked on it um, for, for, you know, for, uh, on my, by my own and uh, in the office. And then suddenly there was uh, COVID came along and I had to move into my basement and uh, I worked in my basement on the drawings, uh, but it was difficult because the museums were closed, the research centers were closed. I had to beg in some cases for them to send me material. And so then I had all the drawings more or less roughed out. And uh, I, of course, knew Angela. She worked in my office and we kept in touch and I said, Angela, maybe you can help me, uh, you know, make these drawings look better and contribute to them. And she accepted, and uh, we think it was in late uh, 2019. And then in 2020, she um, she had this friend Michaela, who she was she speaks on the phone with, and. Uh, I spoke to Michele and I joked about Italians not interested in Adler and Sullivan. And he said, well, you should talk to my friend Marco. And so that's how Marco got in the picture. But what Marco did was extraordinary. He took all the information. Angela sent him all of my research, all of the photographs by Richard Nickel. Every, every, uh, every piece of material I had, and he deciphered it in a way I could not. For example, time, time was running out, so I decided to just do a sketch on how I thought the structure was, and I made some assumptions, and Marco corrected all of them and made them correct. I mean, for example, how they alternated the uh, two-story columns and uh, 
the connections and then furthermore even till this day the the theater entrance is quite confusing and changes were made rapidly on the theater so it was confusing as to how the theater was originally meant to be and i think this again marco straightened out for us um anyway we were all thrilled with that and unfortunately uh, my drawings uh, you know these minor some of these minor details are not on my drawings but uh I'd like to do a portfolio and correct them at some point. That's it.